Ladies and gentlemen, John D. Ratliff. Thank you. Um, I titled my piece, A Brief Sad History of Tolkien Role-Playing Games. So feel free to just interrupt at any point. I was going to read through and then do questions at the end, but if something catches your attention, flag it down. We'll just talk about it then. Uh, when deciding on an appropriate topic for my talk, I considered various possibilities for my 17 years in the industry, 28 years as a gamer, and 35 years as a Tolkien fan and scholar, and ultimately decided it would be fun to combine all of these and share a few some stories from an insider's point of view about the long, sad history of various Tolkien role-playing games, including some I worked on that never saw the light of day. So here goes. First off, the history of Tolkien role-playing games begins not with the publication of the first licensed Tolkien role-playing game, Middle-earth role-playing, MURP, but a decade earlier, with the origin of role-playing itself. At about the time of Tolkien's death, in September 1973, a little startup company with the unpromising name Tactical Studies Rules, TSR, was putting the finishing touches on a new game called Dungeons and Dragons. Dave Arneson had come up with the idea a year or two earlier, and Gary Game out of it, of writing rules so people could learn how to play it. The original D&D was clearly based in equal parts on Tolkien and on Robert Howard, Conan stories, um, as evidence. This is what's called the Fantasy Supplement part of the chainmail rules that came even before D&D itself that turned into D&D. The first two sentences. Most of the fantastic battles related in novels more closely resemble medieval warfare than they do earlier or later forms of combat. Because of this, we are including a brief set of rules that will allow medieval miniature war gamers to add a new facet to the hobby and either refight the epic struggles related by J.R.R. Tolkien, Robert E. Howard, and other fantasy writers, or devise your own world and conduct fantastic campaigns and conflicts based on it. So, right from the beginning, it says these rules are so you can play out Tolkien, Howard, or make up your own. <laughs> the magic system of D&D came out of Jack Vance, The Dying Earth, and John Belair's The Face in the Frost. The attitude was copped from Fritz Lieber, the Fofford and Grey Bowser series. And they threw in bits and pieces of Pratt and DeCamp's into Complete Enchanter, Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions, and various other pulp writers. Most of these influences were openly acknowledged, both then and later. For example, the final appendix in the Dungeon Master's Guide from 1979, Appendix N, Inspirational and Educational Reading. Tolkien is very prominently featured there. That makes it odd that the profound influence of Tolkien on D&D is generally overlooked and downplayed. This was certainly not the case in the early days of role-playing, as we'll see. The reason for the disparagement of Tolkien's influence on D&D and all role-playing games, I think, are twofold. First, there's a simple fact that Tolkien's innovations are so great they become to be considered generic. Generic fantasy often is another phrase for Tolkienian fantasy. They only appear to be generic because modern fantasy is something Tolkien himself largely created. He's the example that defines the whole category. The very idea of the player character party, a group of diverse individuals of differing races with different talents and specialities who set off on an adventure together is uniquely Tolkienian. It's an innovation unprecedented in earlier fantasy where you either get a hero or a hero and a sidekick. Tolkien influenced fantasy and gaming so profoundly we take his imprint on other authors for granted. His impacts become invisible. Look at how many people spell elves and dwarves with a V instead of elves and dwarfs. Elves may be due to Dunsany, though I doubt it, but dwarves is Tolkien's invention. A lot of people use it without even realizing. The spelling dwarves was invented. Yeah. But it's completely consistent with knives. It is. That's why he used it. You had wolf, wolves, knife, knives, dwarf, dwarfs. And he said, that doesn't make any sense. It should have been dwarf, dwarves. And so he invented that spelling. There's some kind of um, um, handicap thing called wolf. 
No, that, that comes from the old usage of the language, that various terms for midget or dwarf are traditional English that go back for centuries. But the plural was dwarfs with an F instead of dwarves with a V. Nowadays, more people actually use dwarves than they do dwarfs. And that's just a sign of how much Tolkien has permeated the language, especially in gaming, especially in fantasy. As a point of interest, Shakespeare did Elves, but it didn't catch on. Elves was the... Elves is genuine old-fashioned English. Spencer has elves, not elves. But after Spencer's time, it died away, and elves became... When Tolkien was a young man, everybody referred to elves. Lord Dunsany was hearkening back to very old literature. He did prefer elves because he also liked old-fashioned. But not many people read Lord Dunsany anymore. Um, I don't think people picked it up from him. I think they picked it up from Tolkien. By the way, Dunsany was one of Tolkien's favorite fantasy writers. Uh, Tolkien might have got elves from Dunsany, but I think he got it from Spencer. I think he got it from the genuine old literature. So there are things that you see in every role-playing game that come from Tolkien, and people don't even realize it because it's just part of role-playing. It's just part of the whole medieval fantasy role-playing. Also, there was a deliberate attempt in later years by Gagex and others that continues to the present day to play down Tolkien's influence. Most notoriously, in Gygax's famous editorial from the March 1985 issue of Dragon Magazine, it's called The Influence of J.R.R. Tolkien on the D&D, Circle R, and AD&D, Circle R, game. Why Middle-earth is not part of the game world. We can come back to this later if you like. It's quite, a, quite an interesting little piece. In this, Gygax argues Tolkien had no discernible influence on the development of D&D. Aside from a few similarities based on Gygax drawing on the same sort of sources Tolkien himself had used. Now, there are three theories regarding this claim which was met with incredulity at the time, more or less universally dismissed ever since, being belied by the evidence. First is what we call the cocaine theory. The widespread belief that years of rumored drug abuse during E. Gary Gygax's time heading up TSR's Hollywood branch had addled his brain. The second is, what, is that Gygax simply forgot by the mid-1980s how he'd created the game in the early 1970s. Um, certainly his story changed a number of time over the years. The general trend of the changes is to shift credit away from others, like Dave Arneson, and onto himself. People remember things differently as time passes, and the more time passes, the less accurately people sometimes remember things. Maybe he simply, simply resented sharing credit with Tolkien. The third, in a word, is lawyers. A fear of lawsuits if a good case could be made for D&D's debt to Tolkien's work. I see nodding. Yes. Uh, two things real quick. One is Sunday I'm replaying uh, an interview of Gary Gygax from just a few years ago before he passed away this year. Yes. Um, from uh, a documentary called Uber Goober, a documentary about gamers. Oh, I'd like to see that. So I have that. Uh, that'll be here Sunday night. Does he make any reference to this issue? Yes, yeah, specifically, like about the drugs and that where it can be, yeah, the whole, all I'd, of that. I'd be very interested to see that. I might be able to shore up one of the other theories a little bit. Yes? Last year, I wrote an April Fool's essay for z <laughs> about uh, the discovery by archaeologists of two castles in Europe that were modeled on Loch Lorien and Dol Gilgit, <laughs> and I positioned them on the Rhine. And someone uh, who had read the essay involved in Gygax's form, pointed them to my essay, and he recognized the region that I was describing, and uh, he was reminiscing about how he'd seen all these castles, and he had never made, you know, realized that they were that ancient or something like that. Unfortunately, when the truth came out, uh, apparently there was some sort of a play war, and the, the guy who turned them on to the essay was thrown off their discussion board. Oh, that's but a shame. The, the obvious Tolkien connection was there for people who were still deeply involved with Tolkien literature, but for people...
people who were not so deeply involved, it, it was just something very unrecognizable. And perhaps Gygax hadn't looked at Tolkien in a long time last I, year. I think it's very likely that it's something he was well into at the time he was creating it, but he was writing his own novels. By the time he was writing articles like this, he drifted a long way from that source material. <laughs> Um, generally human instinct to try to be the right ones, creators, to give yourself the credit for your work and not give other people credit that way. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was partly lawyers, but wouldn't it also make sense if he kind of wanted the credit for himself to feel like the big guy? Yeah, like I said, I, I think there's several things at work, and you know, one of them is you remember your part in it better than you remember other people's part. And so the longer you get from it, the more you remember what you did, the more things get blurred. So. I think it's very normal. The switch from hobbits to halflings, and then the deities and demigods, the, the threatened lawsuits they had. From yes. Man, where they had to pull out the Melda Monet and the mythos from the Elric series, Stormbringer series. And the Lovecraft. And mythos. the Lovecraft series, exactly. Those happened early on, and ever, ever since then, they became much more gun shy about borrowing from other work. Things were very casual and freewheeling in the early days. All right. No matter, let's see, da, 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 da. fear of lawsuits in case any good case could be made for D&D's &D's debt to Tolkien work. And as we'll see, he had excellent reason, based on personal experience, to believe this was a very real threat. Which might explain why he was so adamant about denying any Tolkien influence in the 1985 piece, while freely admitting influence from a number of lesser writers. For no matter how much Gygax might have denied it later on, Tolkien's fingerprints are all over the original D&D. Look at the four player character races from the original three booklet set that came out in 1973 and 74. Men, dwarves, elves, hobbits. Those are the four things you can play. All of them are in Tolkien. Three out of four directly derive. The way they're treated in here, it's clear that they directly come from Tolkien's work. And uh, just breaking the chronology for a little bit, you find the same kind of dominance in the first edition AD&D Player's Handbook, which added half-elves from Tolkien, half-orcs from Tolkien, and gnomes. Um, two out of the three directly unambiguously come from Tolkien. The single non-Tolkien race turned out to be the most unpopular player character race throughout the 30-year history of AD&D. They finally <laughs> dropped it this year with the with fourth edition. Uh, the only thing that you didn't come out of Tolkien turned out to be the most unpopular part of the player character set. I don't think that could be a coincidence. <laughs> there are people that like gnomes. It's, you know, there's nothing quite like a gnome, but it is on Tolkienian. And a lot of people do sort of have a Tolkien mindset when they turn to D&D. &D. Yes? So do you believe that basically deal was like, um, all the other races made sense, what you're saying, but the gnome was just like, like there's a bunch of green dots, and also there's a red dot. Yes, the, the others kind of cohered because Tolkien prepared us for thinking of them as all being in relation to each other. And when they added gnomes, they didn't really make gnomes make sense. They were sort of an outsider, which made them fun to play as an outsider race. It took until they created Dragonlance to actually make gnomes sort of fit in a world. Eberron did a great job of making gnomes make sense, fit in with all the other races. But by that time, gnomes already had the reputation. Yeah? Um, well, um, so you're saying, so Faerun and stuff like that come from Tolkien? No. There are other things which come from other writers later on. Like Margaret Weiss, um, Percy Hickman for Dragonlance. Yes. So that's all their complete invention, except some races. A lot of the basic preconception comes from Tolkien. And then people find ways, okay, let's not do Tolkien. Let's branch off in this direction, and we get Dragonlance. Let's branch off in that direction, and we get a different world. Do you see a system that is ever truly not Tolkien, like just truly original, truly unique? Yes. Um, I would say that Chaosium's system is very un-Tolkienian. Um, it derives from, yes, it's very good, um, but it's, it's not Tolkienian. It could be made Tolkienian, but it's designed, the Call of Cthulhu system was famous that they took 
They took a, an idea, the Lovecraft games, and they created a system that reflected that idea. They also did the same with Pendragon. They wanted to do King Arthur role-playing. They invented a whole new system of rules for that particular kind of game. Um, no one has ever really done that with Tolkien. They've created a system of rules that you could play Tolkien perfectly and nothing else. They've always been more genericized. That's very contentious. We'll get back to that in a little bit. <coughs> Decipher made a good try. But that wasn't an original system. But it, they, they they, that was an original system. Back there? Yeah. <coughs> Do you, are, are you acquainted with uh, Terry Brooks? Yes. The Shannara books? He has no. I was just wondering. I don't remember what the timeline of that is, whether that came after. Those, started. those came out when Del Rey took over from Ballantine Books and said, the Tolkien sells incredibly. We need something just like Tolkien. And so they found someone who would write something as much like Tolkien as possible, illustrated to look as much like Tolkien as possible. It was very deliberately created to try to be the next Tolkien. Um, and he did a few things different, so it wasn't exactly like Tolkien, because you get sued if you put out exactly like Tolkien. Yes? So Middle Earth Roleplaying wasn't exactly Tolkien? Is that Not exactly Tolkien. And that's, that's a point that I'm coming to in just a little bit. It's, it's like Tolkien, but it's not exactly Tolkien. Right, all those were existing systems that then they tried to bolt into a second. Yes. There are two systems out there, a third on the way, currently designed specifically for Tolkien role-playing, the Alpha community. One's called Ambar Quenta, and the other is Hitherlands. Both of those have been developed for a few years now, and they're free PDF downloads. Ambar Quenta and Hitherlands. And Hitherlands are two different projects, and then, of course, my... AI role playing, not the AID 20, but it's yes. the third attempt. Yes. And it, you know, it's taken us a long time. You would have thought this would have happened a long time ago. It's taken us a long time for people to sit down and create Tolkien specific games. It's a very good development. Oh. Okay. So we're going back from the player races. Let's go back to 73 74. Look at the monsters the very first DD adventurers were supposed to face. There are about 60 monsters listed in the Monsters and Treasure booklet that came out late 73, early 74. A fifth of them come from Tolkien. A dozen out of 60. That's a pretty large percentage for something that's that modern. Uh, the rest of them come from classical mythology, things like dryads and medusa and centaur and minotaurs, or medieval legends, things like wyverns, manticores, unicorns, folklore, things like the pixies horror stories, things like the zombies. The contribution of other modern fantasy writers, with the single exception of Lord Dunsany's Knowles, completely absent. You cannot point to and say, that's a monster created by this modern fantasy writer, unless it's Tolkien, about a dozen ex out of 60, or Dunsany, one. The monster descriptions in this book repeatedly cite Tolkien as the source of the monster, misspelling it Tolkien every time. Orcs, quote, the number of different tribes of orcs can be varied as desired, basing the decision on Tolkien or random chance. Whites, barrel whites per Tolkien are nasty critters. Spectres, quote, the Nazgul of Tolkien now fall into this category rather than raids as had been stated in the earlier chain mail. Even rocks, Quote, this term has been used to encompass the large and fierce birds such as the eagles of Tolkien, unquote. And of course, the book's not just marked with Tolkienian spellings like dwarves and elves, but with names the professor invented. Not just hobbits, but also orcs, balrogs, Nazgul. The Nazgul is even featured on the title page. I don't think you can see down here is written the label Nazgul. So the title page of the booklet shows you a Nazgul, not a traditional monster, a very Tolkienian monster, explicitly Tolkienian invented name. That tradition continued in the early supplements. Greyhawk, which was supplement one. Uh, Eldritch Wizardry, which was Supplement 3. Early printings of the D&D Basic set by J. Eric Holm, which was 2nd edition D&D. Even the artwork 
that had appeared back in this original fantasy supplement. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but there's this picture of a dragon by a knight that might look slightly like this picture of a dragon being chased <laughs> by Farmer Giles. This is tracing. With the, they've slightly changed the hero. And that's this is from 1972. The rules that turned into first edition D&D was illustrated by an illustration copied and adopted from Tolkien's Farmer Giles of Ham. That's a fingerprint. That's a pretty good indication that they knew their Tolkien, not just Lord of the Rings, but lesser known works as well. Now, not only was D&D &D in the first incarnation riddled with Tolkien borrowings, TSR even put out a board game, the Battle of Five Armies. 1976, this is where the dwarves, the elves, the men, the goblins, the wargs, the giants, and Bjorn fight various permutations of the great battle from The Hobbit. Uh, this year's Merpcon theme being dwarves. I should note my favorite variation of the rules listed here is the all dwarf one, where the dwarves try to fight off Smog's original attack against the Lonely Mountain. My favorite, this includes a special rule. Quote, for this scenario, Smog may only be killed by bowfire. Note, in this scenario, the dwarves have no bows, unquote. <laughs> so you think about how many times you'd need to play that before you figured out who you want to play in that game. And it's not the dwarves. The only thing missing from that game is the Hobbit. There's no counter for Bilbo. Bilbo and the Hobbit is not mentioned anywhere in the rule books. It's like he put on the magic ring and disappeared out of the game altogether. So you have a game based on The Hobbit with no Hobbit in it. So, in the years immediately following D&D's creation, TSR borrows heavily and openly from Tolkien. Sometime in 1977-78, things changed. Words like Hobbit and Int and Balrog suddenly disappear out of the reprintings of those little digests. They're replaced by Halfling and Treant and Type 6 Demon. Type 6 Demon was a Balrog for about the first four years of the game. Suddenly, it changes. We hear no more of Nazgul, but only of Spectres and Raids. There are no more Tolkienian board games like the Battle of Five Armies. These changes were only on the surface, as is shown by the first hardcover role-playing game book, the AD&D Monster Manual, which came out the end of 1977, describes halflings as falling into three subgroups, hare feet, stout, and tall fellows, which correspond exactly to Tolkien's Harfoot, Store, and Fellowhide. So what happened? The answer can be found obliquely in Kristen Thompson's excellent book, The Frodo Franchise, which came out in 2007. It's a history of the making of the Peter Jackson movies. In her account of the way film rights to Tolkien books got sold and resold to various filmmakers and studios, she describes how finally Saul Zantz bought both the film and film merchandising rights in 1976, and by 1978 had set up Tolkien Enterprises to handle all licensing based on the Bakshi film. Everything from Lord of the Nazgul piggy banks to puzzles that when you put it together made a photo of Tolkien himself. This is important because conventional wisdom ascribes to the Tolkien estate a reputation for laying down the law and descending like a hammer on people who use Tolkien names and characters without approval. In fact, in almost all cases I've been able to trace, this is not the Tolkien estate, that is the Tolkien family, but Tolkien Enterprises, or Saul Zantz, a man famous for having once sued John Fogarty for sounding like himself. You know the Credence Clearwater Revival story? No need to go into that then. Given the uncertain state of Tolkien copyrights in the 1970s, which is another story we can come back to later if you like, it's almost certain that it was not the Tolkien estate, but rather Zantz's Tolkien Enterprises that sent TSR their cease and desist, somewhere back around the end of 1977. 
Whereupon Gygax and company at once filed the serial numbers off. Except in a few odd cases such as orc, which they ludicrously began to claim came not from Tolkien but from an Irish word for pig. Which led to silly looking pig snouted orcs in the monster manual. Because if they could prove it came from a different source, they didn't have to change it. And to Mithral, which they simply decided to misspell. There was Mithral in the original game. Suddenly it became Mithral. Surprisingly enough, that worked. Otherwise, they went their merry way. The advent of Tolkien Enterprises into the story complicates things. Most people don't realize almost all the Tolkien-related items they see, aside from books and some calendars, are not approved by the Tolkien estate, but instead are part of film licensing, over which the state has little control due to poorly defined licensing right in the original contract Tolkien signed back in the 1960s. Among things that fall under Tolkien Enterprises' control are not just the Peter Jackson movies and the older Bakshi films, and obvious movie tie-in products like posters, chess sets, replica swords. But the entire Merp product line is movie merchandising. All officially approved Tolkien role-playing games, collectible card games, board games, and computer games for the last 30 years have been licensed not from the Tolkien estate, but from Saul Zanz as examples of film merchandising. One effect of TSR's transparent attempts to genericize D&D and get away from the Tolkien roots meant that after about 1977, there was no longer even an unofficial Tolkien role-playing game on the market. Though there were some board games from SPI, such as War of the Rings, that I've been trying to find out, later printings of them had a licensing statement on them from Tolkien Enterprises. I've not been able to find out if the original printings had that or not. It looks as if they did, but I haven't been able to confirm it. In any case, the abject failure of the Bakshi film, financially and creatively, seems to have forced all of any attempt to officially license a Tolkien role-playing game for about five years. But by 1982, Iron Crown Enterprises had acquired the Tolkien license, launching MERP, Middle Earth Role-Playing, in 1984. While a long-running line Merp never won over the majority of Tolkien fans who were gamers, who continued to run D&D variants. Despite a co core of devotees, it remained a game more collected than played, uh, which is one reason I was happy to see such a well-used set of rule books here, because usually I see them and they've clearly been bought and never read. They've clearly sat on shelves and not been played and used. Except the modules can be bought their reference. Yes. And I know a lot of people that were Tolkien collectors who bought them because they were Tolkien material. I know a lot of gamers who bought them and used them for their D&D games. Um, I knew very few people who actually played them using the Merp rules, which was a pity. But there were some. There were a few. But not nearly all of the people who were, play who were Tolkien fans who were playing role-playing games. I think the reason that more people collected than played it were threefold. First, D&D's unofficial motto has always been, plagiarism is our friend. <laughs> that is, D&D stills so widely and is such a flexible system, it's easier to tweak the game you already know, which in any case originated as a sort of Tolkienian game and has stayed fairly close to those roots, rather than to start over with a new rule system. It's very easy to take D&D and make play out a Tolkien scenario with Tolkien races, Tolkien names, Tolkien setting. Second, once Iron Crown got the license, they didn't create a new rule system from the ground up. This is what we were talking about earlier. That was designed to capture Tolkienian role playing. Instead, they adapted their house system, Role Master, which itself had originated as a D&D variant to Tolkien's world. As proof, Iron Crown began releasing Tolkien modules as early as 1982, such as Angmar, Realm of the Witch King. They did not release the rules to play them with until 1984, two years later. So they were actually releasing adventures and source books for Merp before there was a Merp. If you see, there is no Merp logo up here. 
once the MERP rules were out, all the role master rules in here worked. They were made as compatible systems. So you wound up with a form of role master adapted to Tolkien rather than a new game designed to play Tolkien. And I should just point out, I didn't bring very many because there's a limit, but the beautiful role master map, MERP map, which I have right side up, shows one feature of the way Merp developed Tolkienian role-playing. If you look at the part of the map they adapted from Tolkien, you'll see the coastlines are relatively smooth. Everywhere that it goes off of Tolkien, it turns out Middle-earth has fjords. There are fjords to the north and fjords to the south. Fjords here, fjords... Every place that's not directly from Tolkien, while a beautiful map, is fairly un-Tolkienian. The way Merck developed the line was very distinctive, but it did diverge a good deal from Tolkien's own. And this was just interesting. This was the first Merck product I picked out. This is a still from the Ralph Bakshi movie to show how closely tied people don't think of Merck as being connected to the film at all. But one of the very early Merck products, in fact, had a film cover. Okay. The decision to using the pre-existing system rather create a new Tolkien-based game led to some disconnects, the most serious of which is the presence of animist or clerics as one of the core player character classes. Tolkien's works are resolutely devoid of clergy, spellcasting, or otherwise. Remember, this is back in the early days. The Cimmerian has not been out too long at this point. Finally, third. Since this was an official license, the modules and source books could use names and places taken directly from Tolkien's works. No halflings, no Mithral. You could have hobbits. Iron Crown's decision, probably dictated by the terms of the license, to stringently avoid the actual time and story of Tolkien's books, meant we got no adventure of Aragorn, no epic box set allowing you to play through Bilbo's journey, or the various component quests that make up the Lord of the Rings. Instead, you got detailed source books set for the most part a millennium and a half before the time of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Yes, you did have some board games, which were very much the exception to that. But this is the, this is the route most of us expected the role-playing game to take. Scenarios based on the Fellowship of the Ring, scenarios based on the Battle of Five Armies. Um, instead, this is board game, isn't it? So the licenses must have been a little different, that they could do things in the board game based directly on the characters and time and story of the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit. But for some reason, they did not do that in the role-playing. Most of the role-playing games are set, what, about 1600 Third Age? About that. 16. So around in the middle there. A bit of a disconnect. So that's really appeals to a diehard Tolkien fan like myself to find out what, say, Moria was like a thousand years before Frodo went there. But that, I'm a small segment of the role-playing game population. If you can only sell it to me and people exactly like me, you don't sell enough. It needs a wider appeal. <laughs> Nevertheless, Merp was a successful line. It lasted for a full decade. Other games came, other games went. Merp went on for a long time. By 91, 92, it was a low ebb. When the license came up for renewal, Tolkien Enterprises let it be known they were interested in negotiating with other companies to purchase some all-new Tolkien role-playing game to replace Merck. And this is where I enter the story. How are we doing on time? All right. I'd started working at TSR as a games editor in October 1991. It was well known around the office and well known to anybody who knows me that I'm a big Tolkien fan. My expertise is in Tolkien liter is in fantasy literature and Tolkien in particular. It's one of the reasons they hired me. I'd done my dissertation on the great Irish fantasy writer, Lord Dunsany, the first man to create his own pantheon of fantasy gods. I like to say I have a degree in fantasy because it's a degree in English with a dissertation on a great fantasy writer. In my first few months at TSR, I had edited the complete book of gnomes and halflings, which I kept telling them would have sold much better if it had been the complete book of halflings and gnomes. <laughs> Therefore, when TSR started negotiating with Tolkien Enterprises to see if they could reach an agreement for a Tolkien license, 
on a TSR Tolkien game, I was appointed to be the editor. Bill Connors was assigned to write the game. Even though no license had yet been signed, we got to work on the project. It was tentatively added to TSR's master schedule. So here is the schedule for 1993, listing every novel and every game product that was scheduled to come out. And though you can't see it very well, this line, Special Projects, Tolkien role-playing game and the various supplements. It got far enough to be on our release schedule for that year. It got far enough for playtest, character sheets, character generation rules, and what I thought you might enjoy, the prototype cover by Rob Ruppel. You might have seen this. This later got reused in several art books. This was to be the cover of the TSR Tolkien game. Sauron holding up the ring. Yes? Was that a game based, uh, created for Middle-earth? Yes, it was going to be a game created specifically for Middle-earth. Um, it was going to be an introductory game because they were convinced that introductory games was the, were the holy grail. That role-playing games were too complicated, they needed to be simpler, they needed to appeal to a younger audience. And so this was going to be their entry game that got people to play role-playing games and then move on to D&D and things like that. So, in the hopes TSR might be able to expand beyond what Iron Crown had been allowed to do, I was even dispatched to meet with Christopher Tolkien as representative of the Tolkien estate and Mary Butler, who was in charge of managing the Tolkien line at HarperCollins, who had just taken over as Tolkien's publisher. By the way, I became the first person to ever receive official permission to Miss Gen Con in order to attend another event. Um, my wife still has memories, that was our honeymoon, <laughs> of us being given two enormous bags full of books to take to that meeting to show them art books, the atlases Karen Wynne Fonstadt had done for TSR, all this material to show how TSR did quality work in artwork, in cartography, why we were such a good person they should give us the license. In the end, the estate was not willing to grant TSR rights they had denied to everybody else, unsurprisingly, such as permission to write and publish sequels to The Lord of the Rings and prequels to The Lord of the Rings. If you've ever seen the Dragonlance series, they did the Dragonlance Chronicles, and then they did the Origin series and the prequel series and the Next Generation series. TSR wanted to do that to The Lord of the Rings. They said no. They wanted to commission art books. They wanted to release a line of calendars, all of that sort. What TSR could do was exactly what Iron Crown had done, release its own Tolkien role-playing game, which I have no doubt would have sold very well. To which Lorraine Williams, the president and owner of TSR, uttered the immortal line, not worth our while. If all TSR can do is put out a Tolkien role-playing game, that's not worth our while. So, thus died the Tolkien TSR role-playing game. Banished to the land it might have been. Shortly thereafter came news of the renewal of Iron Crown's license. A new edition of Merp followed in 1993. It's my impression this later iteration was not as successful as the game's first run. But it did well enough to see the release of about two dozen more supplements, the last of which, Hands of the Healer, was released in 1997. By this time, Tolkien Gamer's attention had largely shifted to collectible card games. The first such game, Magic the Gathering, had been created in 1993 by Richard Garfield at Peter Atkinson's request. It was an immediate hit. By 1994, the rest of the industry was scrambling to put out their own collectible card game. It's not well known, I think, that among the collectible card games, Wizards of the Coast had been asked to create at this time based on existing role-playing games such as Jihad, based on White Wolf's Vampire the Masquerade, Legend of the Five Rings for Alderac, and Netrunner for Artalsorian was a Merps-based collectible card game for Iron Crown. After a year or so, Wizards decided not to do the Tolkien card game after all, and the sub-license rights reverted to Iron Crown, which immediately put together Middle-Earth the Wizards in 1995 to great success. 
This remained one of the best-selling collectible card games for several years. Despite the great success of Middle Earth The Wizards, the associated role-playing game languished. It either quietly lapsed, ah yes, the Tolkien Quest books. Yeah, those are this awesome. is also related to the attempt to make it yes, a introductory system. Yes, they did do an introductory system not long after they relaunched the game. Or just Yes, I believe this is right when they relaunched the game, a much simpler version, their own entry-level version of the Tolkien game. And the Tolkien Quest books, which would have been even more successful if their license would have allowed them legally to do it. <laughs> Uh, these, unfortunately, they, their license specifically forbade them doing books. They could do modules, they could do rule books, they could do anything that was in a softbound format, or they could not do anything that was in a novel format. They regretted it. You might have noticed they did two or three Tolkien Quest books, and then they suddenly changed to be Middle Earth Quest. Because while Tolkien is a very specific name, Middle Earth, you can claim comes from traditional Middle English. So while these are very well done, and they were very popular, they didn't have the license to actually release them. So this did cause them, unfortunately, some trouble. The, the role-playing game license either quietly lapsed or went into abeyance around 1997. I don't see any more paper products that came out after that. By 1999, the license was up for grabs again. And there was anticipation. Yes? Uh, Chris Seaman was working with a new group of writers in the late 90s yes? to upgrade the work. And the negotiations over licensing because of the movies disrupted Iron Crown Enterprises' plans. So what you're getting from me is secondhand information. I consulted with some of the new writers, mm -hmm. but was not involved in the actual module creation. Had that third generation Merv come out, it would have been almost indistinguishable from Tolkien's scholarship-based analyses of Middle Earth. Okay, so second edition had was sort of more or less seen its run, but they were preparing third edition Merv. Is is sort of what you're saying? They they that was in the works but they needed the license to release it. Right, there were two levels of thought there. Iron Crown Enterprises was simply trying to renew the license. Mm -hmm. And I knew from another company under which I was under contract that uh, Tolkien Enterprises was trying to pull all the licenses so that it didn't increase the fees. Yes. And the writers were sick and tired of the pseudo Middle Earth perk. And they had prepared extensive research based on all the Tolkien books four modules. They had Wandering Elves modules, they had New Linden modules, they had uh, a lot of stuff that would have turned heads across the world. I can foresee one problem there that the the Tolkien Enterprises <coughs> license derives specifically solely from the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. They actually had to renegotiate to use the names Alatar and Palantino. I mispronounced that, I'm afraid. Um, the two blue wizards that were used in Middle Earth, they since those do not appear in the Lord of the Rings, but in Unfinished Tales, they had to specifically license those separately. Um, you're not allowed, when writing a Merc product, to cite one of the History of Middle Earth books, or the Cimmerillion, or Unfinished Tales. All of those are outside of the license. They were not going to do it that way. Okay. So, so that's, a, that's a problem, that there's a lot of material that you can't use and you can't take into account because it's not covered by what you have the right to use. Uh, for example, when I was working on a Rohan book, I couldn't draw on anything about Rohan that was in Unfinished Tales. You don't want to write anything that would contradict things you know from Unfinished Tales, but you cannot include any of that material because you don't have a legal right to. You can only draw on Rohan material that's in The Lord of the Rings, which fortunately is a lot of material if you include the appendices. Ah. Anyway, the Tolkien license was up for grabs. Because of the Peter Jackson movies that were already in production, that raised the stakes. And that's when the second Tolkien role-playing game I was involved in began to take shape. By mid-2000, WotC was in serious negotiations for the license. This time around, I was scheduled to be one of the game's three writers, along with Rich Baker, 
by the way, his favorite Tolkien book is The Cimmerillion, uh, whereas many people, it's The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. The Cimmerillion for him is the one st outstanding book. And Andy Collins, who has been with Wizards years, years before they bought TSR. Christian Moore, who was formerly the head of Last Unicorn Games, and at that point was the head of WotC South, was to head up the team. It was to come out as a 320-page hardcover rule book, high production value, edited by Gwendolyn Kestrel, John Pickens, and Jeff Quick, scheduled for November 2001 release. So it would have come out just before the first Peter Jackson movie. We did a lot of discussion what form the game would take. I wanted it to be a D&D game world like Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms. The eventual consensus was it would be a standalone but D&D compatible game. A lot like the Wheel of Time game that Wizards released a year later. I haven't been able to locate any of my notes from the project, but I recall how we debated handling healing, whether it would be with clerics or without clerics, whether or not to allow player character spellcasters. I remember Rich Baker coming up with the Ranger prestige class. Best of all, I remember Andy's truly awesome Nazgul template. If you look at third edition D&D, the ghost template, the various templates, he came up with a really outstanding way to make someone a Nazgul. What you gain when that happens. The old TSR game from 92, as I said, would have been D&D Lite. Uh, because TSR management at that point was obsessed with entry-level games. They released a new entry-level game every year from 1991 to 1996, and they lost money on all but the first one. It was clear that the Wizards game was going to be a very good game. That's what made it so crushing when the license fell through. Second time I worked on a TSR uh, Tolkien game, second time there's no license. The game doesn't come out. I was told by the person in charge of negotiating licenses that she had deliberately decided not to pursue the Tolkien license in order to let a rival game company have it. Otherwise, she argued, we would be open to charges of being a monopoly since we had just acquired the Star Wars license. I thought that a silly explanation then. I think the same today. But this did the same management team that justified canceling one game by saying that while it would have made money, it would have made the wrong kind of money. <laughs> Purple instead of green? They had a business plan. This game did not work in the business plan. It would sell. People would buy it. People would play it. It would make money. But it was the wrong kind of money because it didn't fit the plan. And you have to have a plan. Yes. <laughs> Oh, unfortunate. Looking back on it now, I think it's more likely that there was only so much money in the advertising budget. And that once they'd given it to George Lucas, there wasn't enough for the Tolkien license, especially considering how the film raised everybody's expectations. It probably raised the licensing fee. Also, there was the fact that the people in card R&D, who would have made the Tolkien collectible card game, were adamantly opposed that they would not do a Tolkien collectible card game. They never explained why, but they refused to do it in 1995. They refused to do it in 2000. So it would have only been half a license for the role-playing game. The card game license would have gone elsewhere, which would have complicated things. So the Watsi executives said they were going to go with Star Wars rather than Tolkien. From my point of view, that's the wrong decision, because I am a Tolkien fan. The one good thing that came out of all this, the Watsi, Hasbro, Tolkien Enterprises connection, was the appearance in the year 2000 by Hasbro UK of Rainer Knizia's board game, Lord of the Rings. Amazingly innovative, brilliant designer. This gets my vote for the best Tolkien board game ever. So I highly recommend this game. But that. It is still available. Watsi had so little interest in this that Hasbro sub-licensed it to a different company. All the follow-up came out from Fantasy Flight rather than from Hasbro, rather than from Watsi, which is a pity. It's a really good game. So, Watsi took a pass. The Tolkien license went to Decipher.
who in the year 2000 produced their own The Lord of the Rings role-playing game. Then, June, July 2001, I got caught up in the latest round of layoffs. I left Wizards of the Coast, the second of the three times a form of that company has laid me off. Before the day was out, I had a verbal agreement with the folks at Decipher, which is where most of Christopher Moore's last unicorn team had gone when they left WotC at the time of the previous layoff, to work on their Tolkien role-playing game. So this is the happy ending. Third time lucky. I finally get to help write a Tolkien role-playing game that gets published. My contribution to this was the description of the game world, the first, most of the first section of this book. There and back again, the realms of Middle Earth, which got reused as the booklet that appears inside the box set, Maps of Middle Earth. So that's 2002. Once again, though, rather than creating a rule system to match Tolkien's world, Decipher decided to use their pre-existing house system, the CODA system that they created for playing Star Trek for their Lord of the Rings game. So they're actually rules written for Star Trek that are used to run Tolkien role-playing. Very different universes, you would think. It would be hard to find a system that would work just as well for both. But since their license came directly from New Line, they could not only got to use the era and characters from Lord of the Rings at the end of the Third Age, but the books are chock full of movie art. Most of their illustrations are stills from the films. Unfortunately, they are so dependent upon the films, and like a lot of media licensing, they had an approval process to go through, meant that the releases lagged way behind the films. The Moria box set ideally should have come out at the end of 2001, at the time of the first movie with the scenes of Moria, or at least early 2002. It didn't come out till 2003, until after the second movie was out and available on DVD, and people were getting excited about the third movie in the Gondor part of the story. The Rohan source book that I wrote roughly half of never came out at all. It became clear that Decipher's main interest lay, not unreasonably, in the real moneymaker, their own Lord of the Rings collectible card game. And once again, the role-playing game languished. Eventually, this is June 30th, 2007, according to Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge, which we can trust to, on all specific facts. Our schools say that it's a crappy thing. So Some people say that. <laughs> Nevertheless, Nevertheless, whenever someone posts on Tolkien, it does get fact-checked by everybody else that likes Tolkien. And according to Wikipedia, the Decipher license expired at the end of June of last year. With the result, currently there is no official licensed Tolkien role-playing game. That's unprecedented since the early 80s. More than 25 years, there was a licensed Tolkien game, and now there's not. So. Here we are. The license is in abeyance, waiting relicensing for the re forthcoming Hobbit movie or movies. There will no doubt be yet again another Tolkien role-playing game in a few years' time. Yes. Probably not appear from Wizards of the Coast, but from a smaller company. <laughs> it, there's a good chance more people will collect it and read it than play it, because that's the pattern. Most Tolkien fans will continue to get their gaming fix through a homebrew campaign or by tweaking whatever their favorite game system is to play out a Tolkien scenario. Uh, most recently, that was D23.5 Open Gaming. I think it's probably going to shift to 4th edition D&D GSL. That has, at least, that solves the long-standing clerkless adventuring problem. Just as attention shifted over time from Tolkien board games, the SPI games of the late 70s, to the role-playing games from Iron Crown in the 80s and 90s and Deciphers in the new century, to the collectible card games, now it's massively multiplayer online games that rule the yeah. roost. Yeah. Yeah. Turbines, Lord of the Rings game. I, I, got, no, a, one I, I got a laptop. Yeah. The game with the, with the Shadows of Agmar online. Uh, um, yeah, Very popular game. <laughs> That's where the attention is focused now, is on the online games. According to Kristen Thompson's book, 
The computer games based on the three Peter Jackson movies each made a billion dollars. Three billion dollars for the film's theatrical release, a billion each. A billion each for the film's DVD release. A billion each for the computer games based on each film. Question. Yes. So is like Battle for Real Earth or something, um, did it make a billion? It made it along with the other games based on it. That of money. That's a fan no role playing game makes that kind of money in that amount of time. Do you think between every single game, Ken Carney, do you think they might have hit a billion dollars or Yeah. Maybe. So when we're talking the computer games based on the the films are so popular, the computer games are so popular, but Decipher released a role-playing game even though they were mainly interested in the card game. So, not only will we get a new computer game, we will get a role-playing game. We will get a card game. We'll probably get board games. We'll probably get miniatures games. In the meantime, we have homebrew, fan-based efforts, other hands, other minds, Mercon's AIA project, where those with a love for J.R.R.'s Tolkien's work and a love for gaming create their own rules and enjoy their own version of Tolkien gaming. Yeah? There's uh, an Italian uh, tactical game called War of the Ring. Uh, I don't know that one. I can bring it, bring it tomorrow. Which still here. But it's, um, it's you use plastic miniatures and so on. It's... Apparently, Games Workshop did quite well with their Tolkien miniatures game. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it combines Game Workshop, which has a huge built-in fan base, and Tolkien, that has a huge built-in fan base. I do have one last fun thing to share. TSR had a tradition called the Tacky Gift Exchange. At Christmas, people gave gag gifts, and this was mine. The, the game may not have gotten licensed, but this is J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Adventure Playset, which contains... Bjorn, action figure. Eye of Sauron. The One Ring. And the Simmerils. Notice anything odd about the Simmerils? All four of them? Yes. So someone put, you know, people like to put a lot of time and effort into the tacky gift exchange. Um, you might remember that once TSR did what was called the Women of Fantasy calendar, which was their approach of scantily clad fantasy women. Someone took the calendar, went through catalogs, and got, like, pictures of sweaters and cut them out and taped them and gave it to one of the people on staff so that everybody is sensibly dressed in warm fuzzy clothes. You know, very sensible, very comfortable, sort of L.L. Bean-ish women of fantasy. And that is my talk about long, sad history of role-playing games based on Tolkien, some of which come out, some of which don't. Yes? Um, I have heard that the Cypress Codices have been reprinted in Um, he took over Hero Games. Steve Long was in charge of the Tolkien line at one point. If I remember correctly, originally Christian Moore was in charge of it, and then his group left, and I believe Steve Long was put in charge of it um, when I was writing on it, and I believe after he left to do Hero Games, I believe Jeff Tidball, Tidball was put in charge of it. Um, and I was talking to him when I did the Rohan work. Um, that sounds right that Steve Long was, was basically the person who coordinated all the writers and oversaw the line for a while. And I think he went off when he got the, the chance to do hero games on his own. Um, that, that was always his first love, was the champion system, the hero game system. Um, and I should have mentioned, there's a lot of talent went into these games. I mean, Decipher, if you look at the list of the people that worked on that, Steve Long, you know, there's some really good people worked on these. Bill Connors. Very talented designer. Rich Baker, one of TSR's greats. Andy Collins, who's had a big impact on a lot of role-playing games. A lot of very good people worked on these games, including the ones 
that no one ever saw. A lot of good people worked on the Merck game. Uh, as you were talking about, a lot of effort, a lot of research. Um, other hands, you know, enormous amount of research people put into this stuff. Um, Decipher wanted to get it out as quickly as they could because, you know, the, by the time they got the license, the movies were coming out very soon. They knew it would take time to get things approved. They didn't have a year to create a system. They needed to start writing the game immediately. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that of why there was not more overlap between the Merck people and the Decipher people. I think it's that Decipher mainly went with their own people, the people they had on staff that were writing role-playing games. Because that's what TSR did, and that's what Wizards did. Rather than going to other people that worked on Tolkien games, they went to in-house people that, to work on the game. There is a lot of pitching in the game, right? Industry. Yeah, I remember on the early forums that hey, you, you couldn't even, you talked about this, you couldn't even mention ICQ. They, they would blow a gasket if you mentioned it. Well, we're all purists to different degrees, and we all have our hot buttons of things that set us off. Sometimes they're really major issues, sometimes they're very minor issues. Um, so yeah, there were people that scorned everything Merck did, and there are people that loved everything Merck did. I can see that. Um, that just kind of goes with the territory. Fans are fans. And some fans are easygoing, and some fans are uptight. It happens. Um, on the whole, I mean, we've got a lot of material. There's a beautiful collection of all the stuff that came out, a lot of work. Um, it just makes me sorry. You know, there are so many missed opportunities of D&D &D staying more Tolkien-esque, of getting a system that was closely based on Tolkien. Um, another reason for Decipher, Decipher did not want to go with the D20 rules because this was the very early day of the D20 license. There were a number of companies that thought D20 was a trick, that Watsi was going to get people to convert all their games to D20 and then cancel D20, and basically take everybody, put it, everybody would spend like six months trying to get something to put back in print. Um, paranoia is just a natural feature of a highly competitive industry. But that has kind of happened with the fourth edition in that you cannot have both versions now. It happened seven years later. Yeah, at least, um, yeah, it took a lot longer. Yeah, people had seven years yeah. to sell product right. before they changed the rules. Really and you can still sell D20 product. Yeah, that you license still exists. Yeah, that license four. still exists. But if you go to four, you can no longer... All the rules five. change when fourth edition comes out. And so Decipher, they, were, they didn't know how D20 was going to work. There were not that many D20 products from other companies yet. So they said, this is a big gamble. We want to have our own rule system. If things go really bad on D20, we'll be okay because we'll own the rules. It'll work out okay. Um, so that's why they didn't use the existing D20 rules. And Coda System, they had just developed it. I imagine they were quite fond of it. If you sit down and develop your own rule system, it's the way you want a role-playing game to work. And so, Hammer, that makes things look like a nail. You design things according to your own taste, unless you're specifically told not to. Um, so that's pretty much my presentation. Any questions? Things that I missed? Things I got wrong? Do you remember who was doing the Middle Earth Online game before the Turbine guy? I don't remember who. Uh, yeah, I think Sierra, Sierra was. That, was, was, that, was, Sierra. Yeah, that wasn't on well, there was They Sierra. fired the whole programming staff. They had a yeah, prototype. Sierra. Yeah, Sierra. I was one month away from signing a consulting contract with them when the blog got called. The stakes are very high and changes are very abrupt. And that's a problem now. The movies have raised Tolkien licensing. You know, it's very expensive. It's very serious business now. Yeah, I, I think uh, they were projecting a market of 100,000 players and Sierra said that wasn't big. I don't know how big the turbine is. I know it's successful enough they're getting ready for another big expansion. I think they're going to Moria now instead of Angma. That, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot. You could go in Moria. You could game in Moria for years. Because how big does Moria have to be? Yeah, I was going to take money.
I think it would that it's going to be hard for any small company to get a Tolkien license unless it's a very specific license. Like we want to do a board game. And it's like, sure, one board game based on Lord of the Rings doesn't take away from another board game based on, you know, if it's a small license, if it's a specific license, but the role playing game I think is a big enough deal that really the on, only a big company could afford it. And there's only one big role playing game company really. Um, really Wizards is the only really large company. And then there's a number of second tier companies which are good sized and well established. But I don't think they could afford Tolkien for what I suspect Tolkien would go for now. I'm not certain Wizards could afford it. Yeah, they could, but they probably, you know, they have the, they still have the Star Wars license. And George Lucas is a very expensive um, You, It's really hard to afford George Lucas and something else. And they've had Lucas now for years. You know, the Star Wars miniatures, the Star Wars role playing. Um, I don't see them abandoning that. You know, having missed out on the Peter Jackson movies, I don't see them giving up Star Wars for the next round of Peter Jackson movies. It could happen. I'm not in the loop, but it seems unlikely. Do you know anything about this Middle Earth Games website? They got all the Iron Crown Enterprises artwork. It's a Middle Earth strategic gaming. Is it's it been out for a couple of years? Is it like a library where they list all the all the games? No, 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 no. Is that the English base? It's yeah, it's some strategic. It's base. a play by email game. Oh. Email. This has got all the Iron Crown Enterprises artwork. Because I've read these articles for their newsletter. There was a play by email Tolkien game that started up about 1982 or something like that and ran year after year. Their their ads appeared in every issue of Dragon. You know, for at least a decade. Um, they, they may still be around because they were very long lived. If people haven't switched over to the online games, okay, they're probably the same people. Probably still around. They use all the ICE artwork, interestingly enough. They use the same logo for the work. Yeah, that is, that is one thing that, you know, ICE was famous for really having good artwork. Um, I actually preferred the Gail McIntosh covers to the Angus McBride covers. I'm the only person in the world that that's true of. Uh, but you know, it was high production value. They were well done books. They were well done adventures. Anything else? I think we should probably wrap it up then. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Okay, thank you.